And all I want to do today is to try to sort of make a little bit clearer what loop invariants are, the things that we need, or yeah, the things that we, the rules of loop invariants, that's what we're going to look at here, um, and also trying to understand what the limits of loop invariants are as well. All right? So the first thing is there are three rules of loop invariants. Okay, these are not my rules. They're not rules uh, to do with Wiley. They are the fundamental rules of loop invariants. You can probably go to the Wikipedia page, and I guess it might even tell you. Okay? Um, so the first one that we saw, the loop invariant must hold on entry to the loop. So it must hold at this point when we're going into the loop. That's the first thing. All right? Rule two, the loop invariant must be restored. What that means is, assuming the loop invariant holds at the beginning of a loop iteration, then after the loop iteration, it must still hold. And it's that assuming that's the kind of key and sometimes kind of tricky thing. And we're going to look at that. And finally, the loop invariant must hold um, after the loop. And in fact, that's basically implied by the other two rules. But it's a sort of key observation, I guess. Right? And if the loop invariant doesn't hold after the loop, then it's not a proper loop invariant. Cool. All right. Seems straightforward. Three rules, and we're just going to look at them. Um, now, to try and help, it, the problem with explaining these rules is to try to be clear about what they really mean. Um, and so we're going to start to use this notation, which is a more, uh, I suppose, a more formal notation. It's a more mathematical kind of notation. Um, if you get into research on this kind of um, uh, aspect of programming languages and verification, you'll see this, this notation used a lot. So this is the notation. We call them triples, whore triples. All right? And we've got P is, uh, you can think about that as the information we know before the statement. S is the statement in question. And P is what we know before it. It's the precondition, if you like. Well, it's not really, yeah, it's, you could think of it as a precondition. It's not necessarily actually a precondition. It can be more than that. And Q is what we know after the statement. Sort of like the post condition, but it, it can contain more information. It basically just says whatever we know after the statement. Right? And the statement itself can be, it doesn't have to be just one statement. It could actually be a bunch of statements that we've put together in a sequence that, um, uh, you know, uh, we put together in a sequence that we're combining together. Right? And we can then think about what is what we know before, given that what we then know after. All right? So just as a really simple example down here at the bottom, right? What we know before, x is greater than or equal to 0, x equals x plus 1. Well, what do we know after? Well, we can say that we know x is greater than 0. In fact, we could actually use our, um, if we wanted to be a little bit more precise, we'd use the versioning stuff that we looked at last week, and we'd write something in terms of versions. So we'd have x is greater than equal to 0, and x, x1 equals x plus 1, and blah, blah, blah. But this is, the, this is the, the rough effect. And so the key thing here is, given this, we know this. All right? Cool. Good. So I'm just going to use that notation to try to explain in a kind of concise fashion what these things mean. All right? Um, and we're going to come back and look at it actually in, this, in the system in a moment. All right? Um, so the first thing is, information known at the start of the loop must imply the loop invariant. All right? So what we know coming in here must imply the loop invariant itself. All right? So let's just have a look at it. And you see, I write it like this. So I say R, um, which is whatever we know before our loop, which is not necessarily, well, in this case, okay, it's the requires um, sh uh, clause, just because there's nothing in there. There are no other statements in there. Um, we've got given R, and then whatever statements it is going into the loop, then we've got P, and P must imply the loop invariant. Right? Provided those things are true, then it's OK. Let's just see if we can make that make a bit more sense by looking at actually while itself. So here's, a, here's just a little program. This is the count program. We looked at it on um, uh, last week. I can probably make it a little bit bigger, actually, in this case. All right. Uh, this program needs a loop invariant. Um, so let's write a loop invariant. We've got i is greater than or equal to 0. All right. So there's my loop invariant. 
right now. We can ignore that for the moment. Let's actually take off the let's take off the post condition for now. We'll come back to that because otherwise it just makes it a bit weird. Um, okay, so at that point it's working. And so the key here is that this thing needs to be true on entry. So if I set like this, that's going to be a problem. Right? Um, or I could do some other weird things. So I could have int i here, and I could go uh, requires i is greater than or equal to 0, right? At this point, it should be fine. So at this point, um, if we go back to the slides, right, I've got requires r. So in this case, I've got requires i is greater than or equal to 0. Uh, and actually, going back to that. And then we could have some statements in here, right? So the statements in here are what s refers to down here, all right? So let's just put some statements in there, okay, just to like break it. Let's go i equals i minus 1, right? So at that point, we've now got a problem. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, really. If i is greater than or equal to 0 on entry, that means it could be 0. If I subtract 1, that means it could be minus 1 here. So at this point here, we can conclude only that i is greater than or equal to minus 1, but that's not enough to prove that the loop invariant is true. All right? Not, not rocket science. Um, and the only other bit I'll say about, um, let's get rid of that. The only other bit I will say, let's go put it back like this, in i equals naught. So in the, in the slides, we can see that I've used implication. I've used this, which may seem weird, but it's totally not weird. It, <laughs> I guess that makes sense, but you know. Um, this is what we know after that statement, whatever that might be. It could actually be nothing. Um, and it's got to imply the invariant. It's not got to equal the invariant. It's only got to imply the invariant. Well, what does that mean? Well, in this case, like my statement here is, um, is i equals 0, basically. Um, and I can actually make a strong statement like that. right? And we've got i equals 0, and that implies that i is greater than or equal to 0. It's not the same. It's not i equals 0 means i is greater than or equal to 0. It just means... That doesn't quite, I've got to explain it clearly. i equals 0 is not identical to that, but it implies that that is true. Right? <laughs> Does that make some sense? Kind of. OK. I'm just trying to be as clear as I can in explaining it. All right, good. Um, so the reason I'm doing that is, so obviously this is, this is the easy case, right? Loop invariant's got a hold on entry. It's actually kind of easy. Um, those rules hopefully, or the, the notation hopefully um, makes at least some sense to you. All right? Good. Any questions about that? That's the easy case, basically. All right, good. All right, all right. Let's boogie on then. So, so this is the hard case. Rule two is the hard one. Rule three is not really a rule. It's just a thing. Um, rule two, I think, is the hard one. So what I've written here, I've written it in English to try and help make sense of it. Assuming only the loop invariant and condition hold at the start of the loop, then what we know at the end of the loop must imply the loop invariant. So here we've written, you know, here's my loop invariant i. So if i and c imply p after this statement s, or give p after this statement s, then it must be true that p implies i. It doesn't have to be that p is exactly the same as i, but p must imply i. That's the key thing, all right? It's kind of weird. I mean, maybe it doesn't seem weird, but it, it really is weird. That much I can tell you for a fact. Um, so let's just have a look at that. Um, so let's just do some kind of interesting things. So this one's kind of obvious. That one, it's going to work like that as it stands. The loop invariant there is true. Um, if I try to change it here, then, um, you know, we'd have, right, okay, um, if we wanted to use something weird about i and n, so if I know that i is less than n, then that means I should know that n minus i is greater than or equal to 0. Is that right? Hmm. Interesting. That's kind of weird. It's kind of weird because basically what I've done is I'm using the fact that I know i is less than n, and that implies that, you know, n minus i is greater than or equal to 0, right? That's kind of the key. And that's, that, 
statement there is, is basically what we've got here. And you can see I brought in the condition. The condition C, um, in my particular case, is that I is less than N. And here we've got the invariant, which is I is greater than or equal to 0. Good. Good. Now, see if I can. Uh, I want to do this really weird thing. Let's just see. I just need to actually engage my brain. I've just put in a random array just to, so that I can use it here. Okay. So the key is we want this to be true. We want this thing not to have any errors. And if we think about it, well, let's say we know that i is greater than or equal to 0 here. And we, we know that i is going up. So we must be like, well, i is always going to be greater than or equal to 0. Right? So it should be OK. But it's not going to be OK. It's going to be totally un -OK. It says i could be negative. And that might seem pretty weird, because we know it can't be. And this is kind of the point at which the tool sort of diverges from what we know in the sense that it's not smart enough to think in the way that we think. We think in a quite a clever fashion, I guess. We use induction automatically, but the tool, it doesn't like induction. It hates induction, so it doesn't use that. Um, it's got the brain of like a five-year-old or something like that, all right? Um, so it can't think that clearly. And if we look back at the slides, and this is sort of the most important piece of information, although it's quite subtle. If we look at this, right, this is saying, given the invariant and the condition, we've got to show that the statement produces P and that then we get the invariant, all right? Now, in this case, I haven't actually written an invariant. Um, if we look at my program, I've got no invariant, um, but I have got a condition. But the key thing is what this means is that using only those pieces of information, we're going to look through all the statements in the loop body and draw our conclusions using only those pieces of information. That's the critical bit, not pieces of information that we knew from before the loop. Right? We're going to ignore everything that we knew from before the loop. And that's kind of the really critical thing. So in this case, we're ignoring the fact that we know that i is greater than or equal to 0 from the precondition in the loop. We're using only the invariant and the, con and, um, the condition. So all we know at this point is that i is less than n. We don't know that i is greater than or equal to 0. OK, so the question is, why does the tool behave in this fashion, in some sense, is what you're getting at. Um, and the answer is, you know, in, in some sense, um, yeah, I mean, I could start going down like that, for example, which would kind of mess things up. And the tool would have to sort of think very carefully about what, if it took into account what it knew from before, plus what it knows here, what it actually knows, right? In some sense, what it really comes down to is that the tool would need to determine a suitable loop invariant itself. And that just turns out to be quite difficult. Um, there's been a lot of exciting research on that particular topic. Um, it, it, you know, it would have to figure out the right piece of the jigsaw that is true for all the iterations of the loop in order for it to work. And it just can't do that. So what we basically do is we force the programmer to write the loop invariant. So although this doesn't verify, as soon as I add in the loop invariant, well, then it's going to be fine. You can think of it as a limitation of the tool, but in some sense, oh, what have I done wrong? Not less than length. Oh, OK. Well, <laughs> oh, it's too clever. Damn you. OK, let's, let's go like this. Here we go. This will change it all. Totally going to break my post condition, but that's fine. There we go. All right, good. <laughs> um, so now it's working. And we've had to add this loop invariant. But we don't need the loop invariant. Like, the program is correct without the loop invariant. The loop invariant doesn't affect whether or not the program is correct or otherwise. You know, like, if we write a precondition, we're actually making a very strong statement about the function, what it is and isn't allowed to accept as input arguments. If we write a postcondition, we're writing a very strong statement about what the function is allowed to return in its return value. Right? So we need those things. If we don't have those things, then we just don't know that information. But with a loop invariant, it doesn't actually make any difference to whether or not the function is correct. And it doesn't affect anyone who might call the function or use results from the function. The loop invariant serves no purpose 
other than to help the tool. And that's the key piece of the jigsaw. I know that seems weird, but when you try writing these loop invariants, uh, the weirdness might start to uncover itself, I guess. How are we doing? Cool. Questions? All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we're going to come back and try this. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Cool. So that's what that means. Um, assuming only the loop invariant and the condition, right? That's the key piece of the jigsaw. Don't forget it. All right. Good. Uh, so finally, this is pretty easy. Um, so after the loop invariant, um, we can only, or after the loop, we can only assume that the loop invariant is holding and that the negated condition holds after the loop. We can't assume anything else. Um,